Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today evening. And today I will discuss on the topic of uh, what is destined in our life and what is free for us to choose. So I will talk in terms of a story from the Ramayana where a curse is involved and that curse unfolds in a particular way. So what is <clears throat> broadly speaking the role of our free will and how much of our life is controlled. Now, if we look at this in a broad way we can see that in our life certain things are already fixed. Say for example which family we are born in. The many Indians when they come abroad to a western country whether it's New Zealand, or New Zealand or Australia or America or Canada, UK then they come with some culture from the past from their homes but when the children are born in these countries and the children grow up then these children they often want to mix with the mainstream culture but they just can't because they have a particular skin color their just identity is a particular way in america this phenomena is called as abcd ABCD is American born confused deshis. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could have here NB, N, NBCD. <laughs> New Zealand born confused deshis. <laughs> so basically, even if somebody wants to gel, mix in the crown, you just can't. The brown color is there. So one of my friends in America was telling me that, you know, the Indian kids who are of kids who are born to Indians, see they are like coconuts. The coconut is brown from outside, but white from inside. <laughs> so basically, the brown skin is there, but internally, culturally, because they blew there, they've grown there. So they become like that in terms of thinking. But still, even if no matter how much they want to, they can't become brown skin. So certain things in our life are fixed. Right from our birth itself, they are fixed. So it's not just our skin color, it's also the family in which we are born. In many ways, we could say, our, <clears throat> how good our memory is. We can always improve it, but certain certain level of intellectual ability is fixed at the level of, at the time of birth itself. So certain things are fixed at the time of birth. And we can't change that. So now we could say that life is a constant tension between order and chaos. Order is the things which we have control over, things which we try to maintain in a particular structure and chaos is things which are out of our control. Now as we grow up we try to increase how much control we have. So even a small child, the child is helpless. Just infant, newborn, and just doesn't know what is happening. And the infant cries because there's so much fear, distress, uncertainty. But then as the child starts growing, the child discovers that crying is my power. <laughs> By crying, I can move the world around me. If I cry, then my mother will come running, father will come running. And sometimes the children cry because they are in distress. Sometimes they may cry just because they want attention. So basically, that child, for initially, everything is chaos. Oh, where am I? Who am I? What is going on? Nothing it knows. But slowly, it creates some order in its life. That is, whenever I am in trouble, cry. So that is the one, one strand of order in the child's life. Now, as we grow up further, now we try to create further order in our lives. So for example, education. 
is something at one level it creates some order okay you go to school at this time you attend these these classes you come back and this is not just creating a schedule and a routine a schedule and a routine itself is an order in our life but along with that what it also creates is uh, we create further power to create order in our future lives that through these studies i will earn more money i will get a good job and then with that financial stability there will be greater order in my life all of us okay i think it is okay earlier yeah i think was anyone not able to hear okay is it better now okay can i have a little tissue paper हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओके थैंक यू सो ऑल ऑफ यू आर सिटिंग एंड ट्राइंग टू हियर दिस क्लास देर इज सम ऑर्डर नाउ ऑल ऑफ यू आर रीजनेबली कॉन्फिडेंट दैट द पर्सन नेक्स्ट टू यू is not going to suddenly turn at you and slap you in the face <laughs> now, now conceivably that anything can happen but probably that will not happen and the probability is very high and it is this order this absence of chaos that enables us to focus so all of us need some structure for our lives and it is the structure that enables us to both live peacefully and work purposefully as i am i can be peaceful and what i need to do i can do it purposefully if say right now i am going to speak to class and at any moment the power supply will go away or if assume at any moment if i am worried everybody will walk up and walk and go away <laughs> then i cannot speak purposefully it's like every moment i am worried is the audience going to be there or not so basically we all need a certain amount of order in our lives but at the same time the world often brings chaos so or chaos means say we might decide i am going to go to this program and i'm going to reach at this time and you estimate it takes 30 minutes to go there but then suddenly there's a traffic jam suddenly there is maybe a car crash or something and then half hour becomes one hour and that causes annoyance that causes irritation and annoyance and irritation are probably the small consequences of disorder if suppose you go to your office job and one of my friends in america he told me he had come to india for about 15 days and he because he was in india he didn't attend to he was on a break and holiday so he didn't attend to any of his mails and many mails had come and gone and he thought okay after i come back to office i will go and look at all those mails then he went to he went back to america he went to his office and he saw his office only was not there <laughs> <laughs> in those fifteen minutes, the company itself had closed down. <laughs> so losing your job is one level of chaos, but the company itself disappearing—that's <laughs> an even bigger thing. So chaos can come upon us from any way. Generally speaking, if we consider what are the three kleshas. Adi Dhaivik, Adi Bhautik, Adi Atmik. Yes. Tomorrow I am going to talk about in the seminar on how to deal with discouraging situations. So I'll talk about how discouragement can come from all these three ways. Sometimes we might fall sick. That's Adi Atmik. Sometimes people around us can annoy us. People around us can disappoint us. They can betray us. So that's Adi Bhautik. 
and sometimes the weather can become too cold the weather can become too hot so actually i was in i was in i think it was melbourne and from there i flew to chicago so it was such that uh, melbourne on that day was something like 47 degrees and chicago was minus 47 degrees <laughs> <laughs> it was the, probably the coldest day i think there was some some storm or something had come so it was the coldest day in the recorded history of the planet so it was a, quite a drastic shift so now the weather can change drastically so basically from all these three sources chaos can come upon us and we try to create structure but in our lives also we don't want simply structure we don't want we want order but we also want some adventure we also want to do something new we also want some exploration some experience so we want structure we want order but we don't want only that we want to experience something new so we you can say we live if we all wanted order now we could just live mm -hmm. say for example one of the safest places in the world is a jail <laughs> if there are no gang wars and if there are no thing in the no such problems you could be completely safe in a jail isn't it but who wants to live in a jail isn't it he want freedom to do things so if you wanted to be completely safe you could say i just stay in my home all the time but you would get bored all of us we <coughs> we are uh, most of our thoughts are about ourselves naturally but at the same time we will get bored only with ourselves imagine if somebody told us that okay today whole day you do whatever you want and somebody will record every single one of your actions and the next day you sit and watch everything that you do the previous day Say, will get boring soon. What? What is there to watch in this? Is it? Maybe some special moments in our day we will watch. But if somebody says, just watch the whole day what you did. So every day, one day you act, one day you watch. One day you act, one day you watch. <laughs> I get bored with life. What do I watch so much? Isn't it? So basically, all this analysis I am giving to illustrate this point that we don't want only order. So if whole day I am going to sit and watch what I did yesterday. whole day becomes completely predictable and then there's nothing new nothing special nothing exciting so that's why although we want order but we live at the border of order and disorder order and chaos so that's why there is a constant we live at the tension and the chaos we need to manage the order we need to sustain and how do we go about doing this when we study scripture it is not just stories which were told long ago and people heard it in general if we consider nature nature is quite efficient anything that is not useful gets eliminated that's what um, uh, the theory of evolution is now whether the, the, the it talks about survival of the fittest and to that extent it's fine but from survival of the fittest to arrival of the fittest it's a big leap mm -hmm. how things originated so darwin got many things right and one thing is that only things that are efficient survive it like something simple and only things which are useful which are effect effective they survive so if you are going on a long mountain trek and if you have a backpack which contains a lot of luggage lot of things then we may before starting itself we say hey, you know i don't want to carry so much burden i'll put some stuff away so i'll put that away i'll put that away so similarly if we as human beings if we consider the past centuries people lived through a lot of tough times many of the comforts that we take for granted today say heat artificial heating air conditioning mobile all these were unimaginable even for royalty a few hundred years ago so people had no time to load themselves with unnecessities 
because life was tough. Life is tough even now. But without all the comforts and conveniences, it was tougher. At least uh, we go, if we go back to recent history, a few hundred years ago, a few thousand years ago. So the point I'm making is, if some stories like the Ramayana, the Mahabharata have survived for centuries, then those stories must have served some purpose. In the past, writing books and printing books was not easy. People had to do it on leaves. They couldn't just replicate the books by giving one print command. <laughs> so if somebody was going to go through all that labor, they must have felt that this is worthwhile. There is something worth learning from this. So many atheists are very uh, dismissive about the past. And they say, oh, people in the past were superstitious, foolish, unscientific. But those people survive through tougher times. And, and if you look at history across the world, religion, faith in some higher being, and some stories about how human beings interacted with higher reality. These are universal, whether it is the biblical story in the Western world, the Vedic stories in India, they're always like that. So these stories have some great value within them. And what is one value? We can talk about many values, but one value we can talk about is how to live at the tension of order and chaos. So Ram is living a peaceful life and uh, just a big joyful event is to happen. He's going to be coronated as the king. And then suddenly what happens? In one night, everything changes and he has to go to the forest. What? In America now currently, the government is becoming a little uh, more than a little hostile to immigration. Uh, many Indians, they're not getting their visa extended and they have to come back to India. So, you know, Ram suddenly <coughs> being exiled. It's like exile is just one level below execution. Execution means you lose your life itself. Exile means you lose everything except your life. And to consider how serious that is, Probably the nearest we can get is that we are living in a country and our visa is denied. <laughs> oh, suddenly you have to leave that country. And, you know, your social life is here, your career is, is here, your friends are here, suddenly you have to leave. But still we can go back to our home country, we have a life over there, we have a social circle, we might have to revive it, but we have it. For Ram, it is nothing. Everything was lost. So, it's chaos. So suddenly from order, from a wonderful, joyous order to horrifying chaos. It's how do you navigate such a transition? How does one deal with it? And not only was, it, was the trauma there for Ram, but the trauma was there also for Dashrath. Because Dashrath as the father and no matter how old a child grows, for the parents, still they are our children. And they have that mood that, you know, I, I should take care of them, I should provide for them, I should protect them from trouble. So somehow, for Dashrath to become the cause of that, it was because of his word that he had to send his son, that his son has to go to the forest. Now, Dashrath was so heartbroken that he could never speak those words also. So, that night when Kaikai made the demand and Dashrath was shattered, he begged Kaikai, no, 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 but Kaikai didn't listen. At that time, uh, finally, Kaikai only summoned Ram. And when Ram came there, sometimes if you enter into a room itself, and you can get a sense of the vibrations in the room, isn't it? Sometimes two people, they, if they have a tension between them, as soon as you enter, you also feel the tension over there. Isn't it? You feel as if you are walking into a minefield. Isn't it? So Ram immediately could feel, immediately felt that there's some tension between Dashrat and Kai Kai. And he could see Dashrat was disheveled, distressed. And Kai Kai was looking cold, unfeeling. 
and Dashrath couldn't even speak the words. It is Kai Kai who spoke. You know, based on a promise a father has given, he has told that the Bharat will become the king and you will go to the forest for 14 years. Now Dashrath just wailed in sorrow. He just couldn't do anything to stop it. So it was not just for Ram, but it was for everyone. Suddenly chaos had come. From order, sudden chaos came about. Now how do we navigate it? How do we deal with uh, life when life suddenly throws a horrible change in our lives? Everything that we have held dear, it's just being ripped away from us. So Dashrath protests, but somehow Ram says, I will go, I'll honor your word, I'll go. And when Ram departs, Dashrath just doesn't know, what can I do? What did I do wrong? It was in good faith that he had, and Kai Kai had helped him long ago in a war. At that time, he had given her a boon. That I will fulfill two of your desires. She said, I don't want anything now. I don't want anything. He says, in future, if you want something, you can ask. Now, he had never thought she would ask something like this. <laughs> so, he was bound by the word of honor. So, what did he do wrong? What could he have done? Now, he was searching for explanations. How, how did such a thing happen? How did Kai Kai become like this? How can Ram have to go like that? He was constantly lamenting, berating himself. And slowly his spirit started sinking. And then at that time Kaushalya was initially very upset, very hurt. But then Ram consoled her and said that no, it is, the king is not behind this. The king is obliged, king is not desiring this. Kaushalya had said that, I will come with you. How can I live in a kingdom which has exiled you? If Kaikai has done this, now Kaikai will further do so many things. If she can go to this extreme, what will she do in your absence? Please take me with you all through the forest. So Ram says no. At this point, the king has been terribly betrayed by his youngest wife. This is the time when he needs you the most. If you also abandon him, he will not be able to survive. Now, through thick and thin, we are meant to be together. So basically Ram helped her see that Dashrath was not the victimizer, but Dashrath was the victim. It's, this is one thing we see in the Ramayana, that people are committed to their relationships. See, relationships are tough work. In movies, people say that one person sees another and they fall in love. Now, they say love at first sight. Well, okay, love at first sight can happen. But the test of love is what happens after many sights. <laughs> <laughs> So, any kind of relationship requires, it's hard work, it requires commitment. And if people are fickle, that is, any time a problem comes up, I am out of here. Then, you just, every relationship, it is meant to give us some structure, some stability. But any time some disruption, disorder comes up and you say, I am out of here. Then the very thing that is meant to create structure in our lives, we live in constant fear, this will create chaos then we just can't have any stability. So, uh, Ram reminds Kaush Kaushalya and Kaushalya is constantly with Dashrath thereafter. And then Dashrath says, he's, he's just trying to make sense of what happened. And then he says, I, I remember a curse. Long ago, I was cursed. And then he says that when I had gone hunting, at that time, I was practicing hunting simply by sound. Sometimes enemies might attack uh, from behind or from in, uh, some, some invisible place. So uh, just hearing the sound and fighting, that's also an important skill. So he was practicing that and he was waiting 
in behind some bushes near a pond and he heard someone uh, someone lapping water and he shot an arrow and that arrow went and thudded into someone and he just felt happy i hit the target but then his happiness changed into horror because he heard a human scream in pain he ran there and he saw a brahmin boy over there who was that shravana so and shravana is very say what what wrong did i do to you and he is just is how can you can apologize for small things when you are killing someone how can you apologize what is the meaning of an apology also at that time so he said my parents are blind no they have no one except me they had asked me to get some water so what did I, um, so he had come to take at least please go and give them water now when he went there he gave them water but people who are say not having one sense they become sharper in other senses so just by his footsteps they could make out this was not shravan so he says who are you and with a heavy heart dashrath told the whole story and they said it was it was completely a mistake and they said that you have killed our son he says he was our everything and because you made us die in separation from your son we curse you that to I, that you will die in separation from your son now here this was not they were not being vindictive they didn't say that your son will die they just said you will be separated from your son so the point is that you have done some bad karma and you have to get some consequence for that if they had been vindictive they said your son will die and that's how you will be separated mm -hmm. but what happened as dashrath heard remembered the story and he oh, that curse is coming true and he told kaushalya that now i think my time of my death has come she says no no you are healthy but the hand of destiny was moving but this understanding oh that curse was there that's why this happened that helped dashrath to gain some kind of tolerance some kind of acceptance some kind of closure when something bad has happened as long as we are resenting it it, it just why did this happen why did this happen why did this happen that just dissipates our energy and we hurt ourselves and we can't move forward so remembering that curse enabled him to gain acceptance and then that night when he went to sleep the next morning when the birds came to sing and wake him up he didn't wake up he had gone to sleep forever in his sleep he departed so now here the shura now this raises two three questions so if somebody is cursed does that mean that they that everything is preordained that this is how things are going to happen and oh, now how does all this apply, apply in our lives so, so there are two things there is intolerance not intolerance but within tolerance there are two things which need to be carefully understood the difference see tolerance is accepting reality it is not resigning ourselves to reality acceptance and resignation are two different things when we equate or conflate the two then we feel how can i accept this? if we think that acceptance is resignation then we refuse to accept and then we hurt ourselves or if we equate acceptance with resignation and we do nothing that is also not desirable so that will be the theme of the subsequent discussion now, any questions till now Prabhu, yes ma'am the destiny is the situation we face in our life and with our limited life uh, liberty and uh, the free will 
hmm. how we face the situation to accept the situation as it is or how we can overcome the situation yes okay that's what i'm going to discuss in the subsequent okay. talk okay so i'll conclude i'll come up to that so now let's look at the point that dashrath he experienced chaos when he experienced that chaos that his son went away and his wife turned against him now to go through chaos to live through chaos we need some some strand of order at least and this is remembering this curse helped him make some sense of things and that's how he accepted so now could we say that does that this means everything was destined that kaikai's curse was also kaikai's change of heart was also destined that ram's going to the forest was also destined that shrad's dying was also destined what all was destined no the curse the curse was basically that shrad would be separated from ram and he would die now how that separation would come about that can happen in many different ways it this doesn't justify what kaikai did now a if say uh a comes and suddenly gives a slap to me he says why did you slap me i just gave you your karma <laughs> what <laughs> first of all how do you know my karma is it and who gave you the right to give you my karma give me my karma even if it is it's if a goes and slaps b now it could be that b deserved to be slapped for something but if a takes the law in one's own hand and does that it a who gets implicated it is sometimes the law of karma you can keep it below law of karma if it is not understood carefully then very peculiar understandings can come up so i was in uh, i was i i was giving a class in stanford and before that somebody had spoken in karma so after my class one person asked the question he said that you indians you love cow so much and you say that if somebody slaughters a cow then what will happen oh yeah they will what will happen they will be born as yes as a cow and they will be born as cows and they will be slaughtered so that means all cows now were cow slaughterers in the previous life <laughs> so what's wrong with killing them <laughs> it that's a distorted understanding see this is in logic it's called the error of the antecedent error of the antecedent means a leads to b if a then b but that does not mean if b then a that means that say if you say if it rains the pavement will be wet so if a then b so today uh, tomorrow morning i go out and i see the pavement is wet but does that mean it has rained yesterday no. not necessarily maybe there's a leakage and water has come out or maybe somebody was watering the grass and some water spilled over or maybe somebody was carrying some buckets and water spilled so many other causes could be there unless we can say that b cannot happen for from any reason except a then we could say if b then a so if a then b does not mean if b then a so similarly if somebody slaughters cows then they will be slaughtered they will become cows so that means the point here is if a then b but that does not mean if b then a that does not mean all cows were cow slaughters this is the point also is of karma is that the point here is that we get the consequences for our actions and even if we assume for argument sake that a cow was a cow slaughter in the past actually cows are so gentle <laughs> it's difficult to imagine them as being cow slaughters in the past but even if we assume for argument sake uh, is the cow slaughterer now given the authority by karma to slaughter the cow no who gave them the who gave them the right to take the law in their own hands and uh, this is called vigilante justice sometimes some people take the law in their own hands and they decide this person is a criminal i'm going to shoot him now sometimes movies of vigilante justice may become popular but in real life if people become vigilantes 
the law and order would collapse so so the point here is that we have to understand karma carefully so yes because of that mistake that happened from dashrath he was supposed to be in die in separation from ram but that doesn't mean that what kaike did was right what kaike did was still wrong but destiny's plan is so expert that destiny can use even people's misdeeds to further its own plan but when they do a misdeed it is it is destiny which is acting through them prabhupad would sometimes talk about how in the in the communist countries there was a sustained campaign against atheism in fact we all hear about the first world war second world war but in the communist countries uh, more than 100 million people were killed the government itself killed its own citizens so more than any religious violence and terrorism now more than world war 1 and world war 2 communism was official atheism so people say religion causes violence but the history shows that atheism has caused far greater violence of course we can say that it's neither religion nor atheism that causes violence it's people who cause violence but people can use religion to justify violence people can use atheism to justify violence but the historical record says that when there is atheism people can cause people can and have caused far greater death and destruction so what this communists would do is that they would they would uh, uh, they would take all, all the bread all the food to themselves the government would snatch all the produce so even if you have your own field and you have grains over there you cannot eat those grains the government will come and take all the grains and the government will decide how many grains how much grains your family needs and the government will provide you that much so then what happened is that they would go to the church so there was still some some religion was there and they would go to uh, they said why are you going to church they're going to pray to god what are you going to pray christians have that standard prayer oh father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us a daily bread the prabhupada said this prayer shows your love for bread not your love for god <laughs> it's okay at least we are going having enough faith in god that we are going to god for that but anyway they would go there okay pray and then they would come out and they would say that okay so did you get get your bread she says no okay now you pray to us please give us our bread and they would have truck loads of bread ready and they would give it see so who fulfilled your need god or me oh you fulfilled therefore there is no god follow us so prabhupad said that you know this was short sightedness that actually if we consider as I, the point i was making is destiny can act in various ways so the same god whom they went into church and prayed to that god fulfilled that prayer through the communists <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes something that is meant to happen can happen through people who have no intention for doing something doing a part of something higher or being a part of something higher so although kaikai did this dashrath was still responsible sorry kaikai was still responsible although kaikai was giving dashrath's in a sense karma to him but she didn't have to do that it could have happened in some other way maybe ram went to the forest for something and that time dashrath died he would have died in separation it could have happened in many different ways so but dashrath was able to accept see generally if somebody has hurt us then the resentment against them the sense of betrayal the sense of hurt it it can be a, it can become a big burden on us so it is not that dashrath completely forgave kai kai she still wronged him but he did not have that enormous negativity against her so he was able to accept what happened and he ended and he was able to depart from the world gracefully generally there are different ways to die but if somebody dies in their sleep we can say at least to our vision the death is not very violent not very painful he just departed and because he was so closely related to ram devoted to ram obviously he was elevated so for all of us sometimes when we get this chaos Dashrath was able to make sense of the chaos 
chaos by uh, he remembering the story. Now what do we do? I said we will talk about the difference between accepting and resigning. So whenever things go out of control or whenever a lot goes out of control we have two choices. One is keep fighting against the thing that has gone out of control. A thing that has changed terribly. And sometimes it's just irrevocable. You can't do anything about it. The other is we accept what has happened and then focus on what we can do. So acceptance is acceptance and resignation. The main difference is in resignation we think nothing is in my control and I give up. Acceptance is where we accept this can't be changed. So then what can I do? What can I do? So broadly speaking, if you consider Indian civilization or Eastern civilization versus Western civilization, Western civilization has always focused more on changing things. Something has gone wrong, change it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. In Eastern civilization has been more accept. It's happened, accept it now. Now, both can be taken towards extreme. We, we all need to change things. As I said, we live at the tension between chaos and order and chaos. So, if we try to manage the chaos too much, control the chaos too much, how oh, this is not this, change this, change this, change this, change this, change this, then what happens? There is no stability. We keep trying to change and then the structure gets lost by that. Because structure can be the structure can be established only based on the things that are in our control. Things that are out of our control, we can't have order over there. So too much trying to change leads to instability. That's why we see in the Western culture, whenever people come to an uncomfortable situation, just change. So relationships have very less stability. Right. In fact, nowadays, what to, if you consider marriage, many people don't even get married. Because they, they just don't want any commitments. So then the family is the most fundamental structure underlying society. But if we, we can't accept, okay, sometimes people are not the way I want them to be. Or not the way I expected them to be. But still let's move on with life. But when that, when that inability to accept change is there, then just finish this off, give it up. Now of course you could go to the other extreme and sometimes if we just... It, we make acceptance into a fetish. Then even if somebody is being abusive, even if somebody is being uh, excessive in their actions, we might just passively accept it. So in, in a sense, one reason why invaders were able to conquer and rule India was because the Kshatriyas were quite in this mode of changing things. But the people in general just accepted. Whoever is a ruler, we will pay taxes to them. That's how a few thousand Britishers were able to rule millions of Indians because Indians did not have that mood of revolution. Now, whether that is good or bad, uh, we could say some people say it's bad, you know, Indians are always passive. But it's not that Indians are passive. And the Indian culture is civilization is probably the only civilization from ancient times that has been surviving. Because the Chinese is also surviving, but modern China is very, very different from ancient China. Modern India is also very different. But still, there's a lot of similarity. Otherwise, if you consider Mesopotamian civilization or Mayan civilization or so many other civilizations, Aztec civilization, none of them are actually there now. So there is a resilience that comes by the capacity for acceptance. So for Dashrath, he was able to accept by remembering that curse. Uh, for all of us, how do we accept? We understand that we don't know what destiny holds in future for us. We don't know what the future holds, but we can know who holds the future. We can't know what the future holds, but we can know who holds the future. Who holds the future? Krishna, the Lord. So, beyond this, or beyond our order and the order that we are trying to have and the chaos that is coming in our lives, Krishna exists beyond all this. Sad asad param yattat. The Bhagavad Gita says that. 
there is cause and effect in this world krishna ex ex exists beyond the cause and effect so through the order that we maintain in our life through the chaos that comes up in our life through both krishna remains in control and krishna is expert enough to bring good even out of the bad for dashrath the good that came was that he although he died he died completely absorbed in the remembrance of ram and that although the situation was painful the disposition was completely absorbed and that is why in a sense it was auspicious and because ram went away that's how he was able to combat the demons and he was able to rid the earth of the rakshasas so although kaikai's actions were bad but by the lord the arrangement good came out of it so when we practice bhakti it is not just about doing some ritual he coming to some satsang or he is chanting some japa or doing some puja all these are of course important but the purpose of all these is to help us connect with krishna to make our shelter in krishna if our shelter is in the order that we have established in our life if our shelter is in the job that we have in the skills that we have in the bank balance that we have if these are our shelter that order can go away at any time that doesn't mean this order is unimportant practically it is extremely important but we understand that we alone are not the sustainers of this order it is krishna who has given us some abilities and with those abilities we are able to sustain that order and even if that order we can't sustain krishna still remains in control so if we use whatever order we have to connect with krishna then whenever chaos comes in our life and the order that we are created is disrupted we won't become overwhelmed by that certainly it will be a disturbance but a disturbance is one thing and devastation is another thing we won't become so disheartened that will become devastated so sometimes order can be a good foundation by which you can connect with krishna that means that okay when our things are going on more or less well in our life then we can go regular temple we can do bhakti but sometimes order can become an enemy of bhakti because what happens when there's order we think things are fine when i started practicing bhakti about 20 25 years ago i was talking with one of my uncles he was talking about god he said i believe in god he says he is happy there i am happy here <laughs> <laughs> so you know, okay you are happy here but for how long <laughs> isn't it so if our order makes us complacent then sometimes disorder will come up chaos will come hey i'm not happy here what's up dick <laughs> so we try to maintain order but we shouldn't make our devotion dependent on the order devotion is what i want to practice whether there is order or there is no order and sometimes the disruption of the order may intensify our devotion the presence of order may make us complacent things go wrong oh krishna i need your help please help me and that's when we pray to krishna now this doesn't mean that disruption of order itself is desirable the prabhupad was asked that when 1970s at that time it seemed that the world was on the brink of a third world war so prabhupad was asked if a third world war happens will all that death and destruction make people more devoted he said no death and destruction always there in the world he said they may not be as sudden as if a war happens see when people devotion grows when people consciously turn toward god now destruction might cause it was just destruction might temporarily impel them toward god so sometimes chaos chaos can can impel people towards god but if there's constant chaos then that also saps the spirit of people say say for example yesterday on nirjal ekadash and those of us who fasted probably we chanted much more intensely than usual <laughs> mm -hmm. now if somebody says that Hey, you know you chanted so nicely on Nirjal Ekadash. Let's do every day Nirjal. <laughs> <laughs> Then we'll stop chanting only. <laughs> so, 
so <laughs> so too much disorder is also not desirable so it's neither order nor disorder it's neither order nor chaos that actually takes us toward krishna it is our intention our decision our choice that takes us toward krishna and if we have that intention to connect with krishna then through order we'll connect with him and through chaos also we'll connect with him and thus we'll move steadily forward so connecting with krishna is not just about transcending the world connecting with krishna also gives us calmness it gives us clarity it gives us confidence and then what we can do we will be able to do so connecting with krishna helps us to accept not to resign because once we accept okay this i can't change but what can i do in this situation how can i serve krishna in this situation and then we start thinking okay this i can do this i can do this i can do and then we'll be able to move forward dadami buddhi yogam tam ye namam upayanti te krishna says i will give you the intelligence by which you can come to me so by connecting with krishna through order on through chaos chaos we will be able to move forward in our life because through with that that connection will be our supreme order and that will help us just like dashrath found that strand of order by remembering that curse now we may or not may or may not find that kind of explanation when some chaos comes in our life <laughs> but if we have that connection with krishna yeah, this is one anchor that doesn't shake this is a rock that is on which i can have my foundation then we can move forward and we can grow through order and we can grow through chaos both and ultimately by doing like this we become increasingly devoted to krishna we become absorbed in krishna and ultimately we attain krishna's abode which is vaikuntha vaikuntha kuntha means anxiety the anxiety comes because the order may go away any time the chaos may come upon us any time but when we attain vaikuntha then krishna's order is there and the order is there in our hearts and we live joyfully there so i'll summarize i spoke today on the topic of uh, managing order and chaos and we looked at dashrath story so first i started by talking about how in our life we need structure but we also need adventure if it's only structure if somebody does they just whole day watch what you did yesterday become boring predictable and unbearable after some time so on the other hand if everything is disorderly then we won't be able to function at all so we need order order is the respect to things that are in our control and chaos is about the things that are not in our control and we live at the junction between the two we live at the tension <clears throat> so if our order is in our job we might go to office and find the office itself is not there <laughs> what is so what do you do at that time so how to uh, how to deal with life when chaos suddenly descends upon us that was that is what the scriptures teach us through the narratives i talked about people may say that atheists may say hey, everything this religious stuff is old fashioned and useless but nature is efficient it only lets those things which are useful survive other things get eliminated so people in the past lived much tougher lives than us so they still wrote and remembered and preserved these stories because they served some purpose and the purpose that they served was the stories offered them guideline about how to live in the world how to live in the world means how to manage or the how to live with the tension of order and chaos and then i talked about dashrath story how suddenly things changed for him his wife kai kai just turned against him and then for ram to suddenly go out into the go out of the kingdom was like losing everything except his life the whole bad for dashrath it was even more mortifying because he was seen as the cause of all this so how could he accept it he just couldn't till he remembered that he had been cursed because of his accidentally killing shravana and that helped him to gain acceptance now was we discussed that 
although this curse was coming that doesn't mean that kai kai was not responsible our karma may come upon us through anyone but that doesn't mean that person gets uh, is simply being a bhaya medium for the karma that person has their own desires agendas and they are responsible for those we talked about how we should not twist the logic and those who slaughter cows will be slaughtered that doesn't mean the cows are cow slaughterers we talked about the error of the antecedent a if a then b doesn't mean if b then a and so then he was able to accept this and then he departed peacefully remembering the lord and in separation from him so then i in conclusion i discussed about how for all of us destiny means that the order that we have established it might get disrupted any time so by destiny for our birth our birth our color our skin color so many things are determined which we can't change but still within this order there is some opportunity for us to create something new to to create a better life for ourselves and if we do not accept that which is unchangeable then we dissipate our energy in resent, resentment accepting is not resigning resigning means nothing is in my hands accepting means okay this is not in my hands but what is in my hands let me focus on that and the way we can do that is by recognizing that beyond order and beyond uh, chaos there is the supreme lord and our shelter comes our shelter needs to come not from the order that we have established in our world but through our connection with krishna bhakti is not just a, is not meant to be just ritualistic bhakti is meant to make our consciousness spiritual connect us with krishna and then when we have that connection a basic level of order can help us steadily connect with krishna but if the order makes us complacent then disorder chaos can help us intensify our connection with krishna but too much disorder if it is there then that can make us so insecure and life so unbearable that again we can't connect with krishna so now sometimes the disorder will be more in our life sometimes the order will be more in our lives but we in the indian civilizations in the eastern civilizations accept whatever disorder is there just continue with your life in the western civilization the idea is if there is any disorder change that but then disorder keeps coming in many ways and at indian says that there may be passivity that might come if it is taken to an extreme level and say in relationships people might accept even abuse but they are going to the other extreme anything doesn't work just change it that will lead to lack of stability lack of commitment and there will be no social foundation of a family left also so we need a balance and if we focus on connecting with krishna then we will get the intelligence from within of how to maintain the order and how to deal with the chaos and through order and through chaos both we will move toward krishna and ultimately we will attain his abode where we will be free forever from chaos in our loving harmony with him forever thank you very much hare krishna so any questions or comments yes bro thank you very much for a nice uh, uh, talk so you are saying that when something when somebody does something he is he is just being an instrument of fate or instrument of instrument of uh, destiny so so you so you so we can't uh, so but but you also said that he has some he may have some motive like like yeah. he has some motive so so with the motive then how can they be a pure instrument i said they're not a pure instrument, pure instrument. so when something hap- when something happens to us somebody does something to us if they have their own intention then how are they uh, instruments of a karma that's why i said god can use things which in even people's bad action they can also use like the communist side of the example you know god used them to fulfill the need for bread of the peasants so now if they are doing something wrong then we have to decide using our intelligence how to respond so when ram was exiled to the forest at that time he accepted that as destiny mm. uh, but when sita was abducted by ravan ram did not accept that as destiny said so ram fought a war to get sita back so the point is that in different situations we may have to respond differently 
and the basis for that response is uh, what is our purpose tomorrow i'll be talking elaborately about this about how to respond differently in different situations but i can mention this briefly that <clears throat> broadly speaking whenever we face some unpleasant situation difficult situation we have three options i call it as tolerate mitigate or immigrate <laughs> just accept the situation tolerate it mitigate is work to change that situation immigrate is is too messy i'll just leave it now all three are valid approaches depending on what is our purpose a purpose means we all have certain things important in our life say a simple example could be if we are traveling in a local train say in india we have this metro trains in mumbai the capacity of the bogie might be 50 and there are 300 people over there <laughs> <laughs> so you're squeezed and some in every group of people there are some people who are bullies i suppose we are standing and there's a person next to us who starts pushing us and suppose you think you are so strong i'll show you how strong i am and we push them back and they push us back and we get so caught in pushing each other that our station comes and goes <laughs> <laughs> and we are still pushing <laughs> so then could say that it's yeah, just a small thing it's a short journey just tolerate it just if you want to push i'll just move somewhere aside is it so uh, there it's a small thing just tolerate it but suppose that person starts pushing us out of the train itself <laughs> then you can't tolerate it because what is happening is the small thing is where we stand in the train the big thing is we get to the destination so if somebody starts interfering with the big thing that we are doing itself then tolerance will not work so what happens for most people what is a small thing and what is a big thing they are not clear and see if we have nothing to fight if we don't have anything to fight for it's not that we will stop fighting if we don't have anything to fight for we will fight for anything <laughs> <laughs> so small things become big i was in canada i was <laughs> staying at the house of a devotee who is a uh, whose wife are krishna chaos <laughs> hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna okay okay so his wife is a family lawyer actually this devotee he has his own business but he also does uh, he also does vivaha yagya he is a priest so he was telling that we are a complete package you, co you come to viva marriage you go to my wife for divorce <laughs> so i was talking with that mata ji she said that people come to oh, people come to me for such trivial reasons he said that there is one lady who came to me canadian lady and she said that canadian lady and she said that you know i want to separate he says why he said you know uh, i went into my restroom today and i saw that my husband had used my toothpaste without my permission <laughs> <laughs> i said are you serious he said yes <laughs> she said you know i cannot take that case you go to someone else now the point is that if we don't have anything big in we don't have a big thing then the mind can make a small thing also very big that's why we all need to have something big something important in our lives then we can keep small things small so if that happens then okay if, if the person is pushing us out of the train itself then we might have to mitigate now how do we mitigate we might just call out to other people you know this person is troubling me we might call the tc or someone or we find that everybody around seems to be supporting that person maybe there's a gang over there and <laughs> persons then we might decide you know i'll just go to some other bogey other coach i'll go so immigrate so all three can be done with a negative attitude you know or all three can be done with a positive purpose so if we have the purpose clear then we will understand okay what should i do small thing keep it small it's a big thing i have to do something about it okay okay
Any other questions? Your question was answered, I think, isn't it? Yes, Thank somewhat you. answered. Somewhat? <laughs> yeah. Okay, tomorrow I uh, will talk more about that. Yes, dealing with discouragements in yeah. yeah. Yes, from. Well, we often find that uh, people are confused with the fact that what is destiny and what is free will, especially when it comes to the certain challenging situations in life. <coughs> and uh, an example of that, sometimes we hear people say, so, um, they come to the temple or programs, oh, my time hasn't yet come. It's not my destiny that I should come now. When my destiny is right, I will come to the temple. Okay. So what is destiny and what is free will? If somebody says, we invite them to temple and they say that, it's my destiny is not there to come to the temple. My time is not yet come. Well, <coughs> see, destiny determines our situations. It doesn't determine our actions. In every situation, there's always something in our control. So, can we say that uh, I am destined not to come to the temple right now? Well, not exactly. We always have free will and by our free will we can come to the temple anytime. More often than not, uh, this is uh, uh, this is just an excuse used to not come to a temple. And you can just turn it around. Say, okay, okay, you invite them to a temple. Can you come tomorrow evening? He says, no. Why? Okay, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to this party. Maybe it's not your destiny to go to that party. <laughs> <laughs> you would think like that, isn't it? <laughs> if you want to go to the party, you won't let the idea of destiny come in the way for that. Uh -huh. So, if there's a, now this cricket world cup is going on and then there's, uh, you, you, there are people who go from all over the world to, to now you to UK to watch cricket matches. So I was talking with a devotee in London, he was telling me that his friend came from, came from India and I think yesterday or his sister was just a match which was washed away or something like that. So he said he had bought the ticket in black <laughs> and now the government, the, the, if the match is washed off, then whoever has bought the ticket, the, uh, the cricket club will rough, refund them. <laughs> but, you know, he had bought it. I was shocked. It was like something like he bought the ticket for 50,000 rupees or 75,000 rupees, something like that. The, the ticket cost was more than the cost to come to America, cost to you come to UK. So he, he says, it was crazy and he said I probably will get nothing back. Yes. So, you know, there sometimes it, you might go there also, it might not be your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so you go for the cricket match but you can't watch the match. But the point is that um, we don't use the idea of destiny to not do the things which we want to do. Isn't it? So if somebody is saying it's my, not my destiny to go to the temple, then let's be honest. So you don't want to come to the temple. That's not, that doesn't make you necessarily a bad person. But don't use, uh, don't use such rationalizations. Hmm? You have to rationalize, you know. What is the spelling of rationalize? You can have a different spelling. R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-L-I-E-S. Rationalize. <laughs> so when we rationalize, we give rational lies. So now having said that, it is also true that people may need to go to need to go through certain situations because before they realize that okay, this is, is coming to exploring life spiritual side is also important for me. So if that is the case, then if somebody is like that, they don't want to come, then we can just maintain a cordial relationship with them. And sometimes when the life is like a school of hard knocks and sometimes when they get get a some serious knock at that time they might come so if somebody is not ready to come uh, we don't have to condemn them but the best not they don't use the rationalization okay if you're not interested it's okay yeah. but if, if they feel at the end of the interaction that they just met a nice person they feel the devotees are nice people 
then later on when they feel the need to explore something spiritual then they will come to a devotee they will come to krishna but sometimes what we do is just as people can abuse philosophy to not come to a temple we can also abuse philosophy to condemn them so we open the door for people to come to krishna and if they say they are not going to come we just bang the door in their face <laughs> you are an envious person you are a soul who is going to suffer in material existence you are going to go to hell hopefully we won't say something like that but we just open the door and if they don't come in it's fine leave it open for them whenever they want they can come okay but destiny doesn't determine our actions it determines only the situations that we face okay yeah any other questions so we have a choice to choose the situation or we have a choice to face the situation that's what i said tolerate mitigate immigrate is what do you do with the situation either you face the situation and live with it you face the situation and so change that is it our free will. that's of course our free will to uh, choice to face and change the situation or walk away from the situation that's that's the choice we have that's our free will yes there's a question here somewhere so, yeah yeah usually in, uh, in krishna consciousness talking about birth death and old age and disease so these are the four most like chaotic chaotic factors correct yes birth that old age and disease but uh, but sometimes when we put this forward like we people are people don't accept this chaos they saying no oh, life is life is quite good you people are negative you That's people true. are quite negative so can we be sometimes we talking too much about chaos and so that's why when we don't uh, people are not attracted to krishna consciousness because they feel that we are talking too much about chaos that's possible that sometimes if we tell to people about old age disease death and then they feel you are always being too negative and they don't take up krishna consciousness so we have to find out that say if, if a person is here and krishna is here now two things we need to try to when talking with people try to understand what will get them to come towards krishna and what will keep them from coming to krishna and that will vary from person to person so depending on whom we are interacting with we need to customize the presentation i find that talking about old age disease death it just doesn't make sense to most people because the, the at least the media creates the illusion that life is comfortable <laughs> most people feel that life is comfortable somehow just my life is not comfortable <laughs> but i just adjust this do that adjustment with my life will also become comfortable so so the whole culture of comfort and enjoyment that is depicted through the media it makes people disinclined for any radical change of lifestyle they think i just make some material improvement oh, then i'll be happy so what we can do is as one thing which i find very universally applicable is to talk about mind and uh, problems related with the mind mm. in fact if you tell people you are not the body people are just not not, not interested uh, one of my friends was a preacher in russia he told me he gave a class and she told you are not your body then he says one person asked a question if i am not my body then whose body am i <laughs> so i am convinced i am the body so then am i somebody else's body what is going on <laughs> so I, I, for people to they just can't understand it because there's so much in bodily conception or they feel it's too abstract and philosophical so what i find is if you help people understand you are not your mind that everybody wants to understand because the mind troubles everyone and so the standard example i give in my talks with new people at companies or colleges or wherever is that the metaphor of the computer when the the car body metaphor also doesn't seem so relevant to people now the computer metaphor is that in the computer there's the hardware software and user so like that there's the body there's the mind and there's the soul the mind is like the software the body is like the hardware the soul is the user 
and just as if the software gets corrupted you can't use the hardware similarly if our mind becomes filled with negativity with stress with depression with worry then we can't function properly and everybody can feel their mind is often sometimes filled with negativities so now what is happening over here that people if they if they understand and uh, at least consider this model i don't even say this is what the reality is in corporate seminars i say the yoga texts offer us a model of the self which can help us make sense of our own experience life the way we experience life so then we presented that way if people accept that they are not the mind then they have already accepted they are not the body so that has come automatically so in fact there was an article in the new york times about how in the churches in america have rebranded themselves that the whole idea was that god is a cosmic provider i told that prayer god the earth and heaven give us our daily bread now in the western world people are not worried about bread <laughs> if they are worried they are worried about butter <laughs> <laughs> so so depicting god as the cosmic provider i don't need anything i'll pro i have my own ways to provide or my government will provide me many come in of the western country the welfare states so then the churches have rebranded god not as the cosmic provider but as the cosmic therapist <laughs> that when you have trouble with the mind then you go to god and the wisdom from god the devotion to god will help you to heal yourself internally and many people are attracted by that so the point i'm making is we need to if we appear too negative to people then better change that approach and so understand what will get them toward krishna and what will keep them from krishna and then present the appropriate aspect of krishna consciousness to them okay thank you any other questions yes please Okay. Mm. Could Duryodhana have surprised Krishna? Could have? Could he have accepted Krishna's peace proposal and prevented the war? Yes, definitely. He had that free will, and that's why everybody gave that counsel to him. It's, it's this concept of destiny is also very interesting. Actually, this is I have a whole three-part seminar on this, but it's a good point you brought up. So before. the kurukshetra war begins in fact even before krishna comes as the shanti dut at that time vyasdev has come to meet dhritarashtra and vyasdev uh, is also trying to persuade him stop your son otherwise the whole kuru dynasty will be destroyed and at that time dhritarashtra says you know if it's destiny that our dynasty will be destroyed what can i do <laughs> so vyasadev becomes very grave and vyasadev actually he makes the same argument to vyasadev as well as vidura so vidura is more cutting so vidura says o oh king destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves hmm? it's something if you want anybody to ask you what is destiny and what is free will just you can tell this destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves if a student studies for the exam and the studies nicely and still somehow because the competition is too high over there and it doesn't get into a particular university or doesn't get a very good rank that is destiny the student doesn't study for the exam itself that is not destiny <laughs> that is their responsibility <laughs> so so the point is that now vyasdev also says uh, he also he asks us is this war destined and vyasdev becomes very grave and he says the the ways of destiny are very difficult to understand o king we can only do our duty ponder what is your duty in this situation and do that now, after the kurukshetra war 
Dhritarashtra is immensely distressed. He is sinking in an ocean of lamentation. And at that time, Vyasadev again comes back. And Vyasadev says at that time that, O king, do not lament. This war was destroyed. <laughs> now what does it mean? Now was the war destroyed or was the war not destroyed? The point is that philosophy has to be understood in the light of the purpose of the philosophy. Philosophy doesn't just exist in the air in isolation. Philosophy has a purpose. And that purpose ultimately is to inspire us to practice dharma. Inspire us to live virtuously. So, uh, it's like how philosophy can be distorted. Say we could say that when we when we suffer, it's because of our past life karma. Okay, that's okay. Say if there's a newborn baby and the baby is crying, and if the baby is crying, the mother will immediately rush to pacify the baby. If somebody the baby is crying because of past karma, let her go cry. That would be ridiculous, isn't it? So when we can do something to avoid something painful, we should do it. So the mother should be thinking at that time, what is my dharma? So my dharma is to take care of my baby. But sometimes it may happen that despite the best efforts of the mother, of the parents, of the doctors, the baby might have some, some painful disease. And the baby might be crying because of that. Now even if they try, you can't do anything to stop that crying at that time. So then, when something is unacceptable, this is destiny. So before the Kurukshetra war, the Trashtra was told like this, that what is your duty? Contemplate that. And at that time his duty, he was the he was the acting king. So he should have put his foot down and stopped the Duryodhan. But unfortunately he didn't. Now after the war is over, now there is no use beating oneself up. Why did this war happen? Why did I lose all my sons? Just accept that it was, dest it was destiny. Now focus on my duty. Now his duty is at least, okay, that chapter of his life is over where he was so attached irrationally to his sons, especially to Duryodhan. Now close that chapter and move forward in your life. So destiny, so philosophy has to be understood in light of the purpose of the philosophy. That's why I said earlier also, when Ram was exiled to the forest, he accepted that as destiny. But when Sita was abducted, he didn't accept it as destiny. Because his focus was on his duty, on dharma. He says, as my, my dharma in the first case was to obey my father. So it, to obey my father, if he wants me, I will ascend the throne. But to obey my father, if he wants me to go to the forest, I will go to the forest. So his focus was not on destiny. His focus was that in doing his duty, how destiny, the knowledge of destiny can help him. So now, why should I go to the forest? Okay, it, I mean, that's destiny. But his focus was not because it's destiny, I'm accepting it. That this is the duty that I should do. I could have done that duty, but why am I told to do this duty of going to the forest? That's destiny. But when Sita was abducted, at that time, consider what is my duty? She's my wife, I have to protect her. So he focused on the duty at that time. So similarly, with respect to Duryodhan, certainly he had the capacity to choose wisely. And he could have chosen. Now, even if he is destined to die, he might have died in some other way. The, the horrifying war which killed so many people didn't have happened. So he definitely had the free will. Okay. Thank you. So we'll stop here. Thank you very much. La Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Thai Gaur Premanande. Jai.